This, of course, is the outline. Today we're going to talk about Jesus' rejection and the last days of his life. This is critically important, so much so that almost half of all of the Gospel of Mark, for instance, has to do with the last eight days of Jesus' life. So this is the, um, the most important aspect when you study the life and teachings of Jesus, is what happened at the very end of his life, what's called the Passion Week. And then next week, of course, uh, as we've talked, the first hour we will talk about sin and its remedy, the sort of reason for Jesus having come to earth as the incarnate uh, Son of God, and what his death means for us, how that applies. And the second hour next week we will do the final exam. As I say all the time, if, even if you're not taking this for credit, I do recommend that you study the materials that I've provided and that you even take the test because there is no better way to learn this stuff than doing that. Even if you're not doing it for credit, it's not like, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to put this on your permanent record, as they always say. <laughs> yeah. um, there's no downside. You, you're not going to lose in any way. Um, the only person who will know your score is you and me, and I'm not going to tell anybody, so um, please feel free to go ahead and take that, that test, all right? Uh, in order to sort of set the stage for today, you've seen this map before. Um, this is Israel as it existed in Jesus' day. Of course, the main areas, Judea and Samaria, we have here. Those had been the two kingdoms that had existed after King Solomon. The southern kingdom was the kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was the kingdom of Israel. Later on, after the Babylonian exile, when the Jews came back, this was all one governed province under the Romans, and they were just considered regions, Judea and Samaria. In the north is Galilee. Um, Perea is the area just east of the Jordan River, which is right here between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee is the Jordan River. And some of the other areas, Syria in the north, this was called Phoenicia right along here. When we talk about Tyre and Sidon, those were the cities of Phoenicia. The Tetrarchy of Philip and, and the Decapolis were two other areas. The Romans, when they came along, they would divide things up differently in order to administrate them, in order to have governors and things over them. And it's of particular interest that um, Herod the Great had been the ruler over all of this, again, with Roman uh, supervision. The, the Herod reported to the Romans. The Romans were the ones that put him, the people who put him in power. When Herod died, these areas were broken up amongst his sons, and we're going to touch on that um, uh, briefly. This area, Judea and Samaria, was originally one of his sons, Archelaus, who proved to be such a horrible guy and such a horrible ruler, he was eventually deposed. The Romans uh, sent him into exile in Gaul, and he died there. And so they put a governor over this, the fifth in the line of Roman governors. That is a sign directly from Rome, not having anything to do with being a local, a local ruler leader. The fifth in that line, we know of as Pontius Pilate, and he's going to come up today. Um, the area of Perea here and Galilee were ruled by uh, another of Herod's sons, uh, Herod Antipas, who is the man who's responsible for killing John the Baptist. And then Herod Philip, this is called the Tetrarchy of Philip because Herod Philip ruled up here and part of the, uh, the Decapolis, which means ten cities, because there were just ten cities that were loosely associated there. Now, Herod Philip is probably the best of Herod's sons. He was widely respected by everybody, including the, the Jews and the Gentiles who lived under him. Uh, apparently, he was a very decent guy. Uh, he had the misfortune of having his wife leave him in order to marry his brother, which is, uh, which is the reason Herodias was her name. She left Philip Herod, or Herod Philip, to marry um, Herod Antipas, who, as I just said, ruled Perea and Galilee, and it was because Herod Antipas married his former sister-in-law that John the Baptist preached against them, because that was a violation of the law, and that's why he ended up getting arrested, and that's why Herodias, um, the, the sister-in-law who became wife, uh, that's why she recommended to her daughter Salome that she ask for the head of John the Baptist. That's why he was killed, right? So you get a little bit of the politics. Soap operas have nothing on the history. If you ever watched the, the series, which was brilliantly done, I, Claudius, that's, that is a beautiful example of what it was like in imperial area, uh, in imperial families and regimes back then. People marrying their sister-in-law and killing their nephews and 
you know, and on them just for power. Um, that's what it boiled down to. So anyway, that's generally speaking. And today we're going to be talking about the last, the, the uh, end of Jesus' life. He spent most of his time here in Galilee, of course. The last year of his ministry, of the three-year ministry, the last year is called the year of opposition because that's when forces started to align against him. He spent part of that year of opposition in Galilee. He traveled up here into the cities of Phoenicia, Tyre and Sidon, Caesarea Philippi, and then back down, and then later, toward the end of that year of opposition, he came down and ministered in Perea, in part of Samaria and Judea, and ultimately ended up right here, which is Jerusalem. Okay, that's, that's where he spent the last... Um, he was in and out of there for the last several weeks of his life, and then spent the last week of his life, the Passion Week, there. But one of the noteworthy things is that while most of his ministry had been in Galilee, with a couple of trips down into Judea, the last, the last months and, and almost the entire last year, he actually was ranging out into other areas in his ministry and outreach, all of them sort of heading him down toward Jerusalem in the last days. Okay, So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, any questions about that in terms of map? In, in the Perea area, live Gentiles or Jews or both? Uh, both, actually. The reason, uh, if you're in the Pentateuch class, <laughs> yesterday we talked about the fact that when the Israelites prepared to cross over, they were here in what used to be called, this used to be called Moab, you know, before this. And they crossed the Jordan River to the city of Jericho right here. That's the first city they came to to conquer. Before they crossed the river, Two and a half of the uh, tribes of Israelites um, uh, asked if, well, can we, instead of going over here and taking part of this land, which is Canaan, that was Canaan at that time, that was the promised land, we'd like to stay over here. And Moses, directed by God, said, okay, you can, you can live in the Transjordan, which means the other side of the Jordan from the Holy Land. You can live over there as long as you agree that your soldiers, the, your armed men, will help us go across and conquer this land. If you help us gain victory, then yes, your share of the inheritance can be over here, which meant there were Jews living over here, which were descendants of those two and a half tribes. Okay, um, And so, yes, it was Jews, but you also get Gentiles. This area here is it was predominantly Gentile. Uh, there were some Jews, like this is Gadara. Um, the, the Legion, uh, the, who lived in the tombs of the Gadarenes, he was a Gentile. And so when Gen whenever we hear about Jesus crossing over the Sea of Galilee, he's crossing from the Jewish part of Galilee, the, the Jewish area, Galilee, which was a Jewish area. Whenever he crossed over here to Gadara and some of the others, that was a Gentile area. And we can even see how Jesus' message actually changed. For instance, when he was amongst the Jews, what's that? To Gentiles and to Jews. Exactly. And the reason is because when he was amongst Gentiles, for instance, he never said, I don't tell anybody about this. When he was amongst the Jews and he performed miracles, he would consistently, particularly it's recorded in the book of Mark, uh, it's called the, the Messianic Secret in Mark, he would heal somebody and say, now don't tell anybody. Go to the priests and make the offering for healing, if they were healed from leprosy or something else that required that, but don't tell anybody. The reason being because, uh, I believe the primary reason is because Jesus was concerned that the Jews would, would, would declare him the Messiah and rise up and try to put him in power, and it wasn't time yet. And so he was trying to keep their enthusiasm quelled. But when he crossed over from Galilee, across, uh, across the Sea of Galilee, or in one case, he came down this way after Caesarea Philippi, he never says that because he's talking to Gentiles. And the Gentiles were didn't have a messianic expectation. They were not going to try to lift him up and make him the king and make him the Messiah and create problems. So he, you can even see, based upon where he is, that there's a slightly different message that Jesus has. Okay? All right. Any other questions about the map or what we're talking about there? Well, one of the things I would mention um, starting out is I mentioned Caesarea Philippi. I mentioned Caesarea Philippi, and this is ah, there. After Jesus had gone up to Tyre and Sidon and then over to Caesarea Philippi, we have one of the significant events toward the end of Jesus' life, and that is the testimony 
of uh, Simon Peter. It was in Caesarea Philippi, up there in the north, that Jesus had sent the guys out to do ministry. And, you know, the, the, at first the apostles, later he sent out 72. But he started out with the 12. When they came back, he said, well, who are people saying that I am? And they said, well, some say Elijah returned. Some say John, uh, John the Baptist back from the dead. Some say one of the other prophets. And Jesus then gets to his real point. He says, well, who do you say that I am? And it was Simon Peter, always the first one to talk. Simon Peter uh, pipes up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ, remember, is the same word as Messiah. Christ is Greek. Messiah is Hebrew. It means the anointed one. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, uh, Simon, son of Jonah, or uh, Simon Peter, basically. Um, it is not from human understanding that this comes, but this is given to you from God, and you are Simon the rock, and on this rock I will build my church because of the confession. So that confession by Peter is a critical sort of turning point. Immediately after blessing Peter for having given that testimony, Jesus then starts talking about the fact that he, and he calls himself the Son of Man here, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and be arrested and killed. I'm going to my death, he was saying. And the, the apostles and disciples are just shocked by this. I mean, they've seen him calm storms and walk on water and raise the dead and heal various illnesses and drive out demons, and you're telling us you're going to be killed? And Peter says, no, no way. You can't. Don't talk like that. You can't tell us that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because he knew that even his closest friends didn't get it enough to accept what was going to happen. But instead, there was a danger that they might prevent him from trying to go to what he knew was his ultimate uh, destiny, which was to die for the sins of the people. Now, there's several places. This is one, uh, the confession of Peter and Jesus' reaction at that time and the fact that he starts talking about the fact that the Son of Man must die. That's one of the places where Jesus has talked about his coming death. He does so in several places. Um, we, Jesus quotes at one point Zechariah 13, which says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He talks about the baptism which he must undergo, which is the baptism of death. He identifies himself as being another in the line um, where all of the prophets had been persecuted and killed prior to him, and that he was another who was going to suffer that kind of experience. So Jesus had a very clear understanding that he was going to his death, and that that was the culmination of his life, as difficult as it was for Simon and the, and the apostles to understand. He knew he was going to die, and that death was a critical part of it. Um, later on, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus confronted with the reality of his coming death, and I don't think it was the death he was concerned about. It wasn't the suffering, physical suffering. It wasn't the death. It was the realization that when he, when he was on the cross, he would take upon the sins of the whole world. And taking sin upon himself, God the Father would not be able to look upon him. This is why Jesus from the cross called out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because when Jesus at that moment had taken on the sins of the whole world, the connection between he and God the Father was broken temporarily. And it wasn't until Jesus had conquered death and the grave and come back that that was gone and the reunion was available between he and the Father. Okay. In the same way that our sin keeps us or has kept us from relationship with God the Father, when Jesus took that sin, he was kept from having that relationship. It was that knowledge that that relationship would be broken even for a short time that caused Jesus the grief that he felt in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he was very clear in his understanding that he was going to be going to his death. Um, now, this is an outline that I used before when we did a harmony of the life of Jesus. And I want to just use this as kind of an outline for where we're going with things. Um, again, the death of John the Baptist, he had been arrested by Herod um, Antipas. And you will remember the story that Herod is married to Herodias, his former, her, his former sister-in-law. Herod's stepdaughter, Salome, dances for Herod and some of his courtiers, the people who are, you know, they're having a big banquet. And Herod, who's probably in his cups, you know, three sheets to the wind, um, whatever expression you want to use, he is so pleased with his stepdaughter, who's apparently young and very alluring and a great dancer, and says, 
I am so impressed with you, I will give you anything you want, up to half my kingdom. Whatever you want, you just tell me, and it's yours. Well, Solomon goes out to her mother and says, you know, stepdad, just offered me whatever I want. What should I ask for? And Herodias, who especially was having heartburn over the fact that John the Baptist was preaching about her being basically an adulteress because she had left one husband and married his brother, Herodias says to Salome, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And so Salome asks that, and Herod, who's in front of all of his friends and everything, has made a big promise and doesn't feel like he can renege on it without looking like a loser. And so he says, okay, and he sends, and the guards cut off John's head, and they bring it back in for Salome and Herodias. That is how John came to die. Now, Jesus hears about John the Baptist's death while he is out doing ministry around the Sea of Galilee. Um, in, in fact, this was, he gets the word that John the Baptist has died, and he's quite stricken by it. And Jesus says he wants some time alone, and he goes off by himself, and he tells the other uh, disciples and apostles, um, you go on ahead, you go on back across the lake, and I'll catch up with you. So they get in the boat and they start back across, not realizing that when Jesus said, I'll catch up with you, he wasn't planning on using a boat. Because this is where Jesus walks on the water. And he's walking back out, but it's because he had wanted to spend some time alone to, to pray about and deal with the death of John the Baptist, who had been his cousin and his friend. And he describes John the Baptist as, there having been no greater person born of woman than John the Baptist. You know, he was a very significant player in all of this. And Jesus walks on the water. That was the point at which from there they then travel north. That's The death of John the Baptist is critical because that kind of marks the start of the real opposition against Jesus. Um, we then have him in Galilee. He feeds the 5,000. He walks on water as I just described it. Um, and then he travels north to Tyre and Sidon, the cities of Phoenicia. He feeds 4,000 more, and there's two of these sort of mass feedings with loaves and fishes, one of 5,000, one of 4,000. Um, we then have Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi in the north that I just described to you, and it's at that point that Jesus predicts his own death. We then have another major milestone in Jesus' life, the transfiguration. Jesus goes, and we believe it was Mount Hermon, uh, there's, it doesn't say specifically, we believe it was Mount Hermon, given the timetable and where they were. Jesus goes up on the mountain and he takes his three closest friends. That is, uh, Peter, James, and John. They were the inner circle. Those three went with him whenever he, there were special things going on, the Mount of Transfiguration. They're the three that accompanied him into the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he had them wait while he went off further. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, they, they witness, that is, the three apostles witness, Jesus meeting with uh, Elijah and Moses the two greatest prophets of the Old Testament, the two who more than any others represented God's word and God's will to his people. The indication is that Jesus is meeting with them. He's, he's having a consultation with them about his coming death and, and what it means and, and to receive, perhaps to receive encouragement. We don't know exactly. But in that moment, Peter, James, and John see Jesus transformed. You know, he's bright light, and they get a sense of his, of his being the divine Son of God, and not just uh, a teacher, not just a rabbi, he's not just a person anymore. Literally, the veil of heaven sort of opens up when Elijah and Moses come, in the transfiguration, they get a glimpse of what the heavenly Jesus is like. And so they come down from the Mount of Transfiguration, a very significant time, and this is another one of those places where Peter um, doesn't know what to say, but he, can't, he still can't not talk. You know people who simply can't not talk. Well, earlier on in his life, I think he must have gotten over this later, but early on, Peter was like that. It's like when he sees this astonishing thing, and I'm sure James and John are just like, whoa. But Peter feels like he has to say something, though. He, so he says, Jesus, how about if we, spit, we build three little booths for you? One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And in parentheses, in the passage in, um, in Matthew, it says, he didn't know what to say. Okay, he apologizes for the fact that he said something really inane at this point. So after the transfiguration, we have several other miracles. Jesus miraculously pays the temple tax by having Peter go and get the, the coin out of the mouth of a fish. Then, um, again, all of this is part of the last kind of circuit that Jesus is doing in the last year of his ministry. He heads south. 
He goes to Jerusalem and attends the Feast of the Tabernacles. He heals the man who was born blind. He visits Mary and Martha in Bethany. Now, Bethany is south and east from Jerusalem. Uh, it's not very far. It's just sort of over the Mount of Olives and down a little bit. So, and they were friends of his, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So he visits them. He then travels a little bit in Perea, that region that's east of the Jordan River. And then, while he's away, Lazarus dies. Word had come to Jesus that he was sick. Jesus doesn't respond immediately. After several days, he go, he leaves and goes to Lazarus' home in Bethany, where Mary and Martha, uh, his sisters, are still there. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And then he does some more ministry in Perea. He uh, blesses the little children. We have the uh, story of the rich young ruler who asks how he might be saved, and Jesus tells him, obey all the laws, and the young man says, I've done all of that since I was a child, and Jesus says, Jesus, who could look into the heart and know what the real problem was, what was the real hurdle for spiritual salvation for this young man, and he said, good that you've done, followed all the commandments, now go and sell all of your goods and give the money to the poor and come and follow me, and it says the young man went away very sad, crestfallen, literally, because he had great wealth. Jesus knew that it was money that was keeping this man from being able to accept Jesus and follow him. Then we have Jesus again predicts his death. This is, uh, there, as I said, there are several times. He heads back across the Jordan, gets to Jericho where he heals blind Bartimaeus. He meets with Zacchaeus. You know Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a short little man, a short little man was he. You guys remember that song from Sunday school? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. See? Um, and then he returns to visit Mary and Martha. And this is the last visit away from Jerusalem prior to the Passion Week um, where Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Now, throughout this last year of opposition, as it's called, you know, Jesus had a year of inauguration and a year of um, real blessing, where people were accepting him and excited, the ministry was growing, and then he had this last third year of his ministry, which was the year of opposition, which led up to his life. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, um, who opposed Jesus, and why? And this is critical. Uh, the first group that opposed Jesus were the Pharisees. And of course, Pharisees have a bad, a bad name with all Christians. You know, who Pharisee, that guy. In fact, the Pharisees were the good guys to the Jews. The Pharisees were heirs to the commitment to the true Jewish faith. If anything, Ezra and Nehemiah, who worked so hard to not only rebuild Jerusalem and the, and the temple, but also to bring the Jews back to the proper faith, the Pharisees were the heirs to that kind of legacy. They were committed to the Jewish faith. They were committed to being pure. But Jesus comes along, and you would have thought that these who really were trying to be righteous, they were trying to be good guys, they were trying to follow the law, but they had misinterpreted some things along the way, you would have thought they would be the ones that would rejoice that the Messiah came. But the Pharisees, and there were, um, we'll, we'll notice, we'll talk about the Sadducees in a minute. The Pharisees tended to be out in the country as well as in Jerusalem. The Sadducees, who, they stuck pretty close to, to the temple and to Jerusalem because that was their power base. But the Pharisees were confronting Jesus when he was in Galilee and various other places. Apparently, it appears as though some of them might even have been following him around to find out what he was doing and what he was saying. Well, the Pharisees perceived that Jesus was preaching and teaching things that were against the Mosaic Law, which is everything they stood for was keeping pure and true to the law as they understood it. They also believed that Jesus was preaching against Jewish tradition. Now remember that there was both the written law, the Torah, the mitzvot as they're called, the commandments that are in the written book, but then there also were the oral traditions. And Jesus managed to, uh, to bother them on all fronts, especially when it came to issues like Jesus' attitude toward the Sabbath. The Pharisees catch Jesus' followers picking heads of grain as they walk to a grain field on the Sabbath, on a Saturday, and eating it. And they went, aha! That's, you're breaking the law. The Sabbath says you can't work. And technically, anything that you do to gather food is working. You can't do that on the Sabbath. And Jesus says several things. One, he says, um, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. 
What he meant by that is God gave the Sabbath day of rest, the seventh day to rest, because these people, the Israelites, had come out of Israel, uh, excuse me, out of Egypt, where they were slaves, where they were forced to work long days every day under the harshest of circumstances. And the Sabbath was God's way, more than anything else, of saying, you're worth more than that. You need to have some time, a day during the week, when you can rest and you can look at uh, spiritual things, not have to work. In fact, this is so important, I'm going to tell you, you can't work. You have to follow this rule. But the Pharisees, over many, many, many years, had taken that gift of the Sabbath and turned it into a burden. They had gotten so strict on the rules of what you could do and not do on the Sabbath that it became a huge burden for people. Um, do you all know what a roof wire is? Anybody got enough Jewish background that they know about an roof wire? Well, this gives you an idea. I'm telling you this because it gives you an idea. Even today, how, how strict, observant Jews perceive the Sabbath as being critical. Um, the, uh, the Talmud, later on, the interpretations of the law, said that a person, uh, a mother, could on, on a Sabbath, could only carry her child across the courtyard of their house, but not anywhere else. You couldn't carry groceries. Any, you know, you could carry things across your courtyard. In other words, within the confines of your house, you were allowed to do things like carry your baby or, or move food and everything else. Well, as Jewish communities developed, and this is still true in some areas, um, there actually was an episode of The Good Wife that dealt with an Aruv wire. Um, if you ever watched the TV show The Good Wife. And what they came up with is as a way to sort of get around this technically is they started defining <coughs> my household by uh, as being a cluster of houses. Like if you had four or five Jewish houses and a shop that are all next to each other, because the Jews tended to live right next door to each other in, in towns, they would put up a wire called an roof wire, like along the outside of the sidewalk, connecting these houses and the stores or whatever, and say, okay, this is all my house. And they would bless it as being their house, which gave them the permission to carry their baby to the next door neighbor's house or to go to the, to go to the store and bring groceries back because I'm still inside my house, technically speaking. Now, that's an example, and even a modern example, of how it was that the Pharisees were so committed to obeying the law that in order to try to do that, they twisted it into things. Um, and the, the Shabbat laws, the Sabbath laws, had become an onerous burden, and Jesus was straightening them out on this. You guys have got it wrong. This is not something that's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be something good. And in fact, Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He claimed the authority to be able to define the Sabbath regulations, which they did not like. So the Pharisees came to oppose Jesus because they saw him first. He claimed, you know, people were claiming he was the Messiah, and they thought he was an imposter. For one thing, he, um, his followers included a tax collector. You know, they hated the, the, the Romans. They thought that the purpose, the main purpose for the Messiah coming would be to chase off the Romans, get rid of the oppressors, the same way that the King David had become a great military leader, that Judas Maccabeus had driven out the, the Persian, the Seleucid rulers that were oppressive. And here, this, this guy, this Jesus, can't be the Messiah. He's got a tax collector, a friend of the Romans, as one of his followers. And so they thought he was an imposter. They thought he was not true to the spirit of being the Messiah. They thought he was violating the law. All of these were reasons why they said, this guy is, is bad news. We've got to do something against him. Okay, we got, even though technically they really were the, the group more than any other within Judaism that was trying to be obedient to God. Okay? And we, we sometimes just sort of dismiss them. when they, they probably were trying more than anybody else. So you get the Pharisees actively opposing Jesus, and they opposed him in Galilee and everywhere else. Now the second group are the Sadducees. These were two theological parties, but you have to remember that in the first century in, in Israel, there was no separation between political and theological. You know, you didn't have a religious party that didn't have political aspirations, because it was a theocracy. The spiritual matters and the, and the political matters were all one. Well, the Sadducees and the Pharisees disagreed on points of theology. For instance, the Sadducees did not believe in any resurrection. 
you will notice that it was a Sadducee who comes to Jesus in the Gospels and, and try, to tr try to trick him with a question. They say, okay, a man is married to a woman. He dies, and consistent with the law, the woman marries his brother. Well, that brother dies. He marries the next brother, all the way down until finally she's married seven brothers. When she dies, who is she married to in heaven? And you can see him sort of grinning when they said that, because the point was they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in any afterlife. So the Sadducees were asking that question in order to try to uh, make Jesus look silly, because they thought that was a silly idea, the afterlife. So the Sadducees, they didn't believe in angels, or they didn't believe in demons. There were a lot of things theologically different, but the main difference was they were the authority figures. The Sadducees, they came from nobility, from ancient, more ancient nobility in the Jewish people. They were the, um, they were the creme de la creme. They were the highfalutin guys. They tended to be wealthy. They tended to run everything. They were the ones responsible for the temple worship and running the temple. Um, and there was a lot of competition between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sanhedrin, the main council of the Jews, was primarily uh, run by the Sadducees, although it did have some Pharisee members. The Sadducees in Jerusalem, they were the people in charge. They perceived, when Jesus came into Jerusalem especially, they perceived that Jesus was a threat to their authority, a threat to the, their authority over Judaism, over the temple. One of the first things that Jesus does when he comes into Jerusalem in Passion Week, um, do you know what it is? After the entry, he, he cleanses the temple. He drives the money changers out of the temple. Well, the Sadducees were the ones that were making money on that. They rented that space because they controlled it. Um, and so you, when, when you get to, uh, we talked about the trial before Caiaphas, which is where a trial happened. But in John, we're told that before they took Jesus to Caiaphas, after he was arrested, they took him to um, uh, Annas, who, was the, who had been a previous high priest, who had been deposed. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, was now the high priest. But it was apparently uh, Annas who had set up this whole making money from having this bazaar in the courtyards of the temple. And so he wanted to see this Jesus who had cost him money and challenged his authority by daring to do what he did by driving off the money changers in the temple. Okay? So they ran Jerusalem pretty much. Um, and they saw Jesus as a threat to their authority. The third group, of course, are the Roman authorities. And the Romans opposed Jesus primarily because the Jews had convinced the Romans that Jesus was guilty of sedition, which means acts against the government, against the authority of the government, rebelliousness, in other words. They convinced the Romans that Jesus was guilty of sedition and that he threatened rebellion against Rome. Um, he didn't, actually. <laughs> uh, quite, quite the contrary. When, uh, again, they tried to get Jesus in trouble, um, one of the Jewish authorities asked him at one point, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And they thought this was very clever of them because if Jesus says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, then they could sick the Roman authorities on him. If Jesus said, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, then they could turn to all of the Jewish people and go, do you hear that? He's on the side of the Romans. And then Jesus would lose his following. Jesus was smarter than that. He said, do you have a coin? And somebody goes, you can almost see him going, uh-oh. Is he going to do it again? You know, make us look silly when we think we're being so clever. He gets a coin, he looks at it and says, whose picture is on this? And they say, Caesar's. And Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. I always picture him flipping the coin back to them. And, and saying, next question, <laughs> kind of thing. But the idea was that the, the, Roman, uh, the Jewish authorities were trying to get Jesus in trouble with the Romans. <coughs> And so some of the accusations that they made against Jesus were specifically pointed in that direction. Let's look at the accusations that were made against Jesus, because that gives us some insight into that. First, he was accused of not obeying the law of Moses, particularly with regard to the Sabbath. And we need to realize that the two things that made a Jew a Jew, as far as they were concerned back then, was for the males to be circumcised and for them to obey the Sabbath. Everything else just sort of follow. But you had to obey the Sabbath, and if you were male, you had to be circumcised if you were going to claim to be a Jew. And they felt like Jesus did not obey the law of Moses, particularly because he challenged their understanding of the Sabbath. 
They also said that he didn't respect the authorities whom, according to, to the Jews, God had placed over the Jewish people. When I say authorities there, I mean the religious authorities, not the Romans. Um, when Jesus questioned the integrity of the, the priests, for instance, um, when he referred to the Jewish leaders and authorities as whitewashed sepulchers, they considered that sacrilege because God had anointed and ordained, so they thought, the leaders of the Jewish faith. And so they held that against him. They claimed that Jesus said he would destroy the temple. There was one time in Jerusalem where Jesus said, destroy this temple, and he was standing you know, in the temple courtyard, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. Well, that came back later, and they were saying, he said he was going to destroy the temple. No, he was referring to himself. Kill my body, and in three days, this body will come back from the dead. But they accused him of wanting to destroy the temple. And you need to remember the great catastrophe that had happened 580 years before, before Jesus, or so, was the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. The great uh, focus of, of Ezra and Nehemiah and the people who returned from the, from the Babylonian exile was to rebuild the temple before even they rebuilt the city walls, which is what Nehemiah contributed, the city walls. Rebuild the temple. The only real credit they would have given Herod the Great, and one thing that they couldn't deny, was that he had made the temple beautiful again. So the temple was the center of their whole religious life, the center of what it meant to be a Jew. And so anything that threatened the temple, anything that suggested anything negative about the temple, the Jews would jump on immediately because the temple meant everything to them. Okay? Then they accused Jesus of committing blasphemy by claiming to be the Messiah and the son, therefore the Son of God. When Jesus is before Caiaphas in the Sanhedrin, we can talk about that trial. Caiaphas says to him, Are you the, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Now, they wouldn't say God. Okay, We've talked before, I think, that they were absolutely forbidden from saying the proper name of God, Yahweh, ever. That was, that was you could be stoned for that. But in order to never even get close to it, they wouldn't even say God, usually. They would say the Blessed One or some other euphemism for God. So Caiaphas says, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of glory in heaven and coming in the clouds of power. And, uh, and Caiaphas tears his robes, which is a symbol of having heard blasphemy. And he declares, we don't need to hear any other witnesses. He has, he's guilty by his own admission. So they clearly understood that he was claiming to be the Messiah and the Son of God, the Son of the Blessed One. Okay? And then he was accused of fomenting insurrection against the Romans and their rule, and they accused him of opposing paying taxes to Rome. So these are all the things that Jesus was accused of, none of which he really was guilty of. It is true that he reinterpreted some things because... They had gotten it wrong over a long period of time. The Pharisees especially, but all of the Jewish authorities, had gotten wrong their understanding of what the Sabbath was. And so Jesus corrects them, but they took that correction as being heresy and not a correction come from God. And so these are the things they blamed Jesus for. Now, if Jesus wasn't actually fomenting insurrection against the Romans and their rule, then why did Pilate go along with this? Why is it that Pilate, now the, uh, the Jews, because they were under the authority of the Romans, they were not permitted to execute anybody. They could only ask the Romans to do so. So, after the trial before the Sanhedrin, Jesus is brought before Pilate. And they say, this man needs to be executed because he's, um, he's a heretic and he's doing all sorts of bad things. He's not obeying the law and he's just really not a very nice person. And so we, we think he should be executed. And Pilate doesn't take that. He doesn't accept that. He says, uh, well, what are you actually charging him with? And at first, when they respond, he goes, you know, you're bothering me with your little problems about your religion. You go sort this out. And they get, no, 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 no. Uh, he advocates not paying taxes to, to Caesar, and he advocates insurrection, and he's causing trouble all over the country everywhere he goes. He, he was causing trouble up in Galilee. Now he's down here causing trouble in Jerusalem. You've got to do something about this. And so Pilate says, okay, I'll look at it. And he decides to, uh, to meet with Jesus in private. 
and interview him. And he does so. He comes back out and says, I find no problem with him. I find no guilt in this man. I'm going to let him go. And they went, you can't do that. And he goes, what do you mean I can't do that? And they say, you just can't do that. And he goes, okay, look, I'll have him beaten and then release him. And he thinks if I just have this guy beaten badly enough, then they'll all be okay with it and I'll go, I'll go home. He has Jesus beaten, brings him back out and goes, okay, now are you satisfied? I, I'm, I'm editing here a little bit, but you get the idea. And the people go, no, no, crucify him. And he goes, wait a minute, you know. He sends Jesus, actually I got this in the wrong order. First thing he does is he finds out that Jesus is from Galilee, and when the Jews are trying, really want to kill Jesus, he sends him to Herod. Because Herod, um, Herod Antipas, is the ruler, you will remember, over Perea and over Galilee. And when he finds out Jesus is from Galilee, he thinks, I'll get this off my plate. I'll send him over to Herod, because Herod was in Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. The Roman authorities, who usually lived in Caesarea Maritima, which was on the coast, they had come down, because it was always a danger, things would get out of hand at Passover. Uh, Herod, who was a ruler up in Galilee, where a lot of Jews had come down, he comes down for the Passover. So he sends him, Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. Herod talks to him for a while, thinks it's kind of fun, but says, I don't have anything to do with you, and he sends him back and says, Herod uh, and Pilate had never gotten along till that day, and then after this, they were fine. Okay. So, he then has Jesus beaten, Pilate does. That doesn't satisfy the people, and he goes, okay, there's a tradition. We release one criminal to you guys at Passover, sort of a sign of salvation, which has something to do with your tradition of, you know, being slaves in Egypt and all that. Pilate doesn't care about that. And he says, we got this really bad guy, Barabbas. And so, you choose. Do you want Jesus to be released or Barabbas? And Pilate thinks this is a done deal because Barabbas is a murderer. He's a known murderer. He is a, he is a revolutionary. He's a horrible guy. The people cry for Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be crucified. And so Pilate finally says, okay, and gives the order for Jesus to be crucified. Now, why did he do all that if he didn't think Jesus was guilty? First, Pilate had little interest in justice or compassion. He didn't really care whether Jesus was guilty or not. That was not a factor to him. In fact, Pilate's reign as governor of, of Judea and Samaria was marked by disdain for the Jewish people and for brutal suppression of all opposition to Roman rule or to his authority. In fact, several years after this, there was a, a, a minor uprising in Samaria, and Pilate's efforts to quell that uprising were so brutal, he got recalled to Rome. And there was a long reputation. Philo, the, the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, writes about Pilate, and he says his brutality, his taking of bribes, his, everything about him was so awful, he was always afraid that Rome would get, find some reason to call him back to take his position away from him. Um, and so, Pilate feared that if he antagonized the Jewish leadership, they would complain about him to the emperor and he would be called back to Rome, would lose his job. And when the Romans caused a, a governor to lose their job, they usually didn't just say, oh, well, you can't have this job anymore. They usually either executed him or sent him into exile or, you know, made him row galley ships as a slave or something else. So Pilate didn't want that to happen, and Pilate's position was especially insecure because uh, he had been appointed as governor over this area by a man named Sejanus. Sejanus had been the first secretary, main assistant, to the emperor Tiberius. He's the one who actually appointed Pilate. Later, Sejanus was found guilty of conspiracy against Tiberius and was executed for sedition. And so Pilate, whenever that happened, they would automatically start looking at anybody who had a connection to the person that was found guilty of, of treachery against the emperor. Pilate was one of those people, so he felt like he was in a you know, very tenuous situation anyway. He did not want any more complaints going back to Rome about him. And then it's probably true that he saw killing Jesus as eliminating any possibility that Jesus might, on a chance, even though he didn't think so, might on a chance actually be an insurrectionist, that he might be responsible for a rebellion against Rome, or, the very least, it would send a, sign, uh, send a warning to any other would-be messiahs or prophets that Rome was not going to take any nonsense. 
that Rome would not allow any dissent, they would not allow anybody to organize anything that would be a challenge to Roman authority. And by crucifying Jesus, he was making that point in a very clear way. Okay? Any questions about that? Why this sort of stuff is happening? Okay? I get up here and I just start talking and I outrun my notes and I don't know where I am. Uh, you chase rabbits. What's that? I chase rabbits. You know, there's all sorts of things. All right. We then come to the last days of Jesus' life, and particularly what's called the Passion Week. We believe this was at AD 30, thereabouts. We don't have exact dates on this. And you think, okay, who was responsible for keeping track of this stuff and forgot what year it was? Well, they simply didn't have accurate counting. The calendar was changed later and much later, centuries later, and they miscalculated exactly when Jesus was born. We don't believe he was born at zero. <laughs> We believe he was born sometime or between 4 and 6 uh, BC, and so we believe his death was around AD uh, 30. Uh, Anno Domini, year of our Lord, AD 30. Passion Week begins with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, all of this time, this is what we know as Palm Sunday, all of this time that Jesus has been ministering to the Jews, he consistently has been saying to them, shh. Don't tell anybody that I've miraculously cured you or driven out a demon. Keep it quiet out of concern that too many people would declare that he was the Messiah prematurely and try to lift him into a role of power, and that wasn't the right time. Now, Jesus allows himself to be recognized as the Messiah unapologetically, unequivocally by everyone when he enters into Jerusalem that day. Um, he comes into Jerusalem. And he chooses, he sends his followers and said, go to a certain place, and there you will find the foal of a donkey, um, a, you know, a colt. Bring it to me, and I will ride it into Jerusalem. Now, there's a couple of pieces of significance about that. One, there was a prophecy that the Messiah would, would come riding on a foal, the, or on a, a, um, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That was a prophecy in the Old Testament. And Jesus fulfilled that. But more importantly than that, and this was this is an important symbol, but one the Jews were probably confused about. Anytime you read about a horse in the Bible, if you ever read a reference to a horse, that means only one thing. That's war. Horses were only used for one thing in biblical times, and that was to fight battles, to pull chariots or to be ridden by soldiers. Everybody else, any civilian, anybody that wasn't going to war would ride a donkey or a mule or, in this case, the foal of a donkey. They thought, they being the Jewish people, thought that the Messiah was coming and that the Messiah was coming as a military leader, like King David, like Judas Maccabeus, to drive off their oppressors. They expected he probably would come on a horse because that was one of the things that would have indicated that he was a military leader. Jesus most pointedly did not come on a horse. He came in a, in a humble way, on a very small foal of a donkey. And so, even so, people must have been going, well, that's a little weird. That's not what we expected. But still, everyone announces uh, their celebration that the Messiah has come. We call it Palm Sunday because we're told in the different Gospels, some of, them, uh, some of the Gospels say, People were laying their garments down for him to walk on. Others were laying down palm fronds. Now again, important piece of history. The palm frond had started to become an important symbol for the Jews during the Maccabean Rebellion, when Judas Maccabeus freed them from the Seleucid, from the Syrian uh, oppressors. That became a symbol of their victory. And so when these people, and this is where we get Palm Sunday, when they were taking palm fronds and laying them in the street for Jesus to ride across on the foal that he was riding, that palm frond was a symbol of, the, of Judas Maccabeus. It was a symbol of freedom from oppression. It was a symbol of military victory. And therefore, it had become a symbol of the Messiah. Okay? So this is Palm Sunday. And he comes in, and everybody thinks, it's the Messiah. It's the Messiah. How wonderful. Now, a lot of these people would not have been from Jerusalem. Remember, this is Passover. Jewish men, especially, were supposed to be, were required to come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And so there had been a huge crowd during that time, and 
Many of them would have been from somewhere else. Some of these people who were, who were you know, giving hoorays to Jesus probably were from Galilee. And they had seen Jesus' ministry in Galilee. They had seen him. You know, they, some of them may have been part of the 5,000 that he fed with the loaves and fishes or had seen him perform miracles and, and uh, cure diseases and drive out demons. So they're, re they're rejoicing and saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, a week later, the crowd in Jerusalem, we don't know if it's exactly the same people, a week later, that crowd is going to be screaming, crucify him, and refusing to take Pilate's efforts to find some way to keep from having to do this. You know, it didn't, Pilate tried sending him to Herod, that didn't settle things down. He tried to have him beaten badly, thinking that would satisfy their bloodlust, that didn't work. He tried to make a trade between Jesus and Barabbas, thinking surely he picked Jesus. That didn't work. Until finally, the crowd is yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And probably the thing, I should have mentioned earlier, the final straw that convinced Pilate to have Jesus crucified is that someone in the crowd at the end, after all of the rest of that, someone cried out, if you do not crucify him, you are no friend of Caesar's. Remember what Pilate's afraid of? That was a, a, blatant, uh, a blatant threat that if you don't crucify this man, we're going to tell Caesar that you are against him. And Pilate didn't want that, so he finally gave in. But here, at this time, a week earlier, they are announcing that Jesus is the Lord's anointed, he is the Messiah, he is the one they've been waiting for, and Jesus does nothing to try to diminish that enthusiasm. Other than the fact he didn't come in on a war horse. But he doesn't say, shh, oh, no, 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 that's too much. You know, he doesn't do any of that. He accepts their recognition of him as the Messiah. This was the time for it, okay? Um, once Jesus gets into Jerusalem, we have the symbol of him cursing the fig tree. And it wasn't because he just had a, a, you know, a hissy fit and said, well, you don't have any fig, darn you. No, this was a symbol. That if that a, a plant, no matter how healthy it might look, if it produces no fruit, it will be cut off. That was a plain symbol. He's in Jerusalem. This is the last week of his life. It was a plain, it's like a parable in reality as to what was going to happen to the Jewish people if they, if they failed to recognize him and the truth of who he was. He then does the clearing of the temple, which is the thing that the Sadducees got so upset about. They considered it sacrilege. You're doing this in the temple. And Jesus said, no, you're doing this in the temple, and I'm trying to clean it up. But the Sadducees, that was a threat to their, to their wealth. It was a threat to their authority. That was something they couldn't countenance. <coughs> Jesus' own authority made this question. People start asking him, the Pharisees and Sadducees respectively, start asking him questions, trying to challenge him and, and bring him down a notch, and none of it works. The whole time Jesus is teaching publicly in the temple, every day he is out teaching in the temple. Then um, Jesus goes to Bethany briefly, he comes back, and the plot against Jesus, the Sanhedrin gets together and they go, what are we going to do to stop this guy? And in this case, very rarely happened, the Pharisees and the Sadducees get together and they plot together. They agree to work together to try to get rid of Jesus. And while they're trying to figure this out, much to their shock, somebody shows up who offers them a solution. And that someone is Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve who are closest to Jesus, who says that he can get them close enough to Jesus to arrest him. Because the, the, the religious authorities knew how popular Jesus was. They had just seen how much people recognized him as the Messiah. And they're thinking, if we go and arrest him in the temple courts where he is every day teaching, if we arrest him, we're liable to have a riot. The people are liable to turn against us instead of turning against him. What are we going to do? Judas Iscariot comes to the Sanhedrin just at that critical time and says, I know where he's going to be, and I can help you arrest him at night so that the crowds won't turn against you. Okay? We're going to take a break for a minute and come back to this. I brought up a different chart here. This is, again, I, uh, those of you who pull this up online, this takes the chronology of Passion Week and lays it out in a different way that's a little easier to see um, in terms of the days of the week, starting with what we know again as Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry through uh, each of the days of the week to Thursday night. I want to talk for a second, though, follow up on the idea of Judas.
On Wednesday, as you can see here, it, it was kind of a quiet day, no, event, no events mentioned, but it was in here that probably end of Tuesday and Wednesday that the Pharisees were meeting. There's, Jesus is inactive, we believe he went to Bethany, he had a quiet day. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees have gotten together and decided the Sanhedrin that they have to do something about Jesus. And right in the middle of their deliberations about what are we going to do about him, because if we arrest him in the daytime, then we're liable to have a riot on our hands. Um, Judas Iscariot comes along and says, I can help you with that. And Judas has always been an enigma in the Christian faith. He, he's a mysterious character in several ways. One, he is the only one of the twelve apostles that was not from Galilee. Uh, Judas Iscariot means Judas of Kerioth. Kerioth was a town in Judea. He was the only one of the disciple of the apostles that was from the south. You know, he wasn't a northerner. Um, it's also true. John tells us that he was a thief. You know, he was the one responsible for keeping the the community purse for the apostles when they traveled around. You know, to buy food and stuff like that. And John says that he, from time to time, would help himself to the money that was in the common purse. Um, so you get kind of this bad picture of him. But we look at this Judas and say, um, how could he have done this? You know, what is the nature of his, you know, what's he thinking? What was the nature of his process by which he came to betray Jesus? And various people have at various times proposed different things. Some have said, well, um, Jesus knew he was going to betray him, and he brought him along because he needed somebody to do that in order to bring things to a head. Uh, or some other people have said that Judas was really a good guy. In fact, there have been some small sects that, that declared Judas Iscariot a saint. In fact, there was, a, there was a, a small Orthodox sect that declared Pontius Pilate a saint. Both for the same reason, and that is because they said that their actions were necessary in order for Jesus to come to the final fulfillment of his mission. Well, I don't think either of those things are true, because um, for one thing, if, if uh, for Jesus to have accepted Judas as a follower, knowing that he was a bad, really a bad guy at heart, would have been disingenuous on Jesus' part. It would have been, he would have been lying about stuff. I don't think, I believe, uh, and likewise, that there's a problem with believing that Judas did this for good motivations. He was trying to make Jesus trying to put Jesus in a compromising position so that he would eventually declare himself and uh, actually become the Messiah that they wanted him to be. But again, neither of those seem true to the events. For instance, if he was really a good guy and he was doing this for Jesus' sake, then why did he end up killing himself? Right? It appears as though the only really reasonable explanation for Judas Iscariot is that he, like all the Jews, wanted the Messiah to be um, like Judas Maccabeus or King David, to be a military leader, to rise up. For three years, Judas has, has attached himself to this Jesus, thinking the whole time, when is he going to stop fooling around? We, we know he's got power. We've seen it all this time. When is he going to finally declare? When is he going to finally take over, get rid of these Roman oppressors, Make us a great nation again, because the, the disciples, it's pretty clear, and the apostles especially, and you understand the difference in disciple and apostle. Disciples were all of those who followed Jesus. The apostles were the twelve that he selected to be his messengers. A disciple is one who follows, an apostle is one who is sent. But Judas was selected as one of the twelve. And uh, I believe, and there's no indication in scripture otherwise, that Jesus saw something in Judas, that he could have been a man of God, that he could have been one of the twelve that would really make a difference, that he could have been one of the twelve who got it, and therefore were responsible for going out and taking the message to the world. And yet, like everyone else, no matter what potential you have, um, everyone has a choice. And Judas made the choice against. And again, I think the reason is, he, after three years of following Jesus, it appears that he finally came to the point of saying, I'm tired of this. You know, I've been sleeping on the ground for three years, wandering around, following this guy. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm having a pill for money to have, you know, a little, a little spent pocket change. This is not working for me anymore. So let's bring this thing to a head. And it, it looks to me, they get to Jerusalem, it looks to me like... Jesus is putting himself on the outs with the guys who really have power around here. You know, let's just clean this thing up. You know, we're gonna I'm going to start all over again by helping 
in this. And so he, Judas Iscariot, goes to the Sanhedrin. He offers his services to them um, for 30 pieces of silver, which he later returns. And he throws it back at them because, uh, and then ends up killing himself. So I don't think that the explanations of either he was really a good guy, that doesn't play, or that Jesus was in disingenuous so much that he brought him along and strung him along for three years, knowing that he was really bad at part anyway. That doesn't really work. Becky first and then, uh, and then Barbara. Didn't Jesus, doesn't he know, didn't he know everything about everyone? I mean, and then he also said, one of you will betray me. Right. And he said, you know, like you need to go on and... And did he knew it would be Judas? Or did he, know? he knew at the end. Actually, the, the places where he said that were in the upper room. Yeah. When he said, one of you seated here will betray me. And they went, which one? And he said, the one who, uh, who dips in the same bowl as I. And at that moment, Judas was like reaching to get the hummus. And Jesus reaches out. And that was the point at which you know, Judas gets up and leaves. Before the end of the time in the upper room. So the prediction, and it is true that Jesus knew the hearts of all men. I believe that up until that last week, up until probably Tuesday or Wednesday of Passion Week, Judas was probably still struggling. And Jesus knew what struggle was going on, and he, he hoped and probably prayed that Judas would choose rightly. And he didn't. In the same way that Jesus says to Simon Peter, when Simon says, oh no, I'll go to my death. Um, Jesus says... Simon, Simon, the devil wants to sift you out, and I am praying for you, but temptation is at your door, and you need to make sure you make the right choice. Well, Judas made the wrong choice, but because he didn't kill himself, he had a chance to repent of that later, and Jesus took him back. I believe that if Judas had still lived and had repented in the same way that, that Jesus did, then Jesus would have taken Judas back. But there was no opportunity for that because Judas committed the ultimate act of hopelessness in <clears throat> taking his own life. Um, I don't know if you got an opportunity to see the Bible series, mm -hmm. but they painted Judas in a very different light in terms of uh, Pharisees, and uh, they said, you know, you really need to bring Jesus to us, otherwise the woman will revolt, and you know what's happened previously, right. and you can avoid all of this if you bring him quietly to us. And that was a whole different uh, perspective. Right. That's a version of the Judas was basically a good guy who, who made the mistake. Yeah. Um, and it's possible. You know, and I'm not saying that that's not possible, but again, the way the, way the thing develops, um, I don't think that's accurate. I think the sense we get is that Judas's heart really did turn dark. The very fact that when he went to them, he said, basically, well, what am I going to get out of this? And they said, well, how about 30 pieces of silver? And he said, score. Um, it, it's sort of how it played out. You don't accept money for something if you're doing it because you really want the best involved. He's betraying one of his closest friends, and he's doing it for money. Uh, later on, he realized that the atrocity of that, and that's why he threw the money back into, you know, into the temple and ran off, but ended up killing himself. So, I'm not saying that's not possible. I don't think that's most consistent with the way Scripture describes the events. I no, especially in taking the money. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, we then have, on Thursday, the event that we know as the Last Supper, or the Upper Room, where Jesus... <clears throat> remember, this is Passover week. This is when the Jews... Passover had to be practiced inside the city. It didn't have to be practiced in the temple, but if you're going to practice um, the Passover, that is the, to, to have the Passover lamb and to go through the ceremony, the Paschal ceremony, you had to be within the, uh, the parameters of the city. And the reason that was said is because everybody was supposed to come to Jerusalem for Passover. It's part of the rules. So they gather at an upper room, and they go through the Paschal feast, as it's called, uh, the celebration of the Passover. And in the process of that, Jesus gives them the words of institution for what we know of as communion, or the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, in which at, um, he takes the bread, and if you know the words of institution, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. You know, he, first he thanked God for it, and he broke it, gave it to them, saying, this is my body broken for you. As often as you shall eat this, do it in remembrance of me. 
And then after supper, likewise, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you shall drink it, do this in remembrance of me. So that communion institution at the upper room, the Last Supper as we know it, um, was Jesus' way of, again, stating, my body and my blood are about to be given for you. And that there is a, there is a very important ritual ceremony. Ritual is a good word there. That's not a negative word. A, a, a ritual practice for you to pursue in order to be able to remember this, to commemorate this from now on. Various churches have interpreted that differently in terms of the, the uh, Catholic Church have, has defined that as tr um, the, the doctrine of uh, the, the body and blood literally, the, the bread and wine literally becoming the body and blood of Jesus, actually changing, even though you can't see the change in it. Transubstantiation, that's called. And various others, all the way down to a, a very modern idea of it, is the idea that this is just a symbol. It's just, you know, it's just a symbol. It doesn't have any real power or authority. We, by the way, fall somewhere in between. You know, it's not really the body and blood, but if we take it in faith, and it has, it has all of the significance, all of the power, all of the meaning, as though we really were consuming the body and blood. It's interesting that later on, the practice of the communion, of taking the body and blood of Jesus in the ceremony of communion, led to, to Christians being accused of cannibalism. That was one of the accusations that the, the early Romans had against them, is that they were practicing cannibalism because they ate the body and drank the blood of their founder. Um, so it, you know, that sort of got in trouble later on, but it's, I think that that was the devil's way of trying to make something negative out of this very powerful uh, representation of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Okay? We then have the Garden of Gethsemane, um, which... You'll, you have the Last Supper, and then Jesus goes to Gethsemane. Gethsemane was a gala. A, a, Gethsemane literally means an olive press. It was a apparently a walled area on the Mount of Olives where there was a press. Jesus goes there. All of his disciples follow him out. Then he tells the rest of them, wait outside the garden. He goes in with James, John, and Peter, again, the three closest to him. And he says, you guys wait here. I'm going to go over here a little ways. He prays three times to God the Father to take this cup from me, meaning that he not have to go through the, uh, the crucifixion. And again, um, I believe the, the, the typical traditional belief is that Jesus was not afraid of dying. Um, death had no fear for him. He had conquered death already in the persons of Lazarus and the, you know, the, the son of the widow of Zarephath. And, but the idea that part of the sacrifice he was going to make wasn't just his death, it was that he would take upon himself the sins of the whole world and that that would be a barrier, even for a short time, it would be a barrier between him and God the Father. That relationship, which was everything to him and had existed for all eternity, that for a brief time, because of our sin, that that would be broken. That was what Jesus didn't want. That was what he, he was most troubled by. But when God the Father plainly says to him, no, this is the way it must be done, then Jesus comes out to James, John, and Simon, Peter, and says, Arise, let us go, our betrayer approaches. And he says that in power, no longer in with a troubled spirit like he had had earlier when he was praying this prayer. So Judas shows up, it's the middle of the night, they've got torches, there are the guards from the temple, they arrest Jesus. The first thing that they will do, and you'll see that here, is they take him to Annas. And as I said earlier, Annas was not the high priest. He had been deposed by the Romans, who claimed the right to, to decide who was going to be the authority. And religious authority and civil authority were the same to the Jews. So he had been deposed, and his, his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was technically the high priest, but the Jews thought that the high priest position was, was for life. Once they got appointed, they served for life. So they didn't recognize the fact that that just because the Romans said so, Annas wasn't still uh, the high priest. So the first thing they do is take Jesus to Annas, and he has a brief time before Annas, so Annas can sort of question him and talk to him. And as I said before, it's believed that Annas was the one, when he was high priest, that's when they set up this sort of trafficking and money changing and sacrificial animals and stuff in the this, this Tuesday Bazaar, you know, the, the tiendes, that, uh, tiendes that they had in the courtyard of the temple. And he was the one that was affected by Jesus having done that. So he wanted to meet this guy that had messed with his business. After being before Annas, they take him to the house of Caiaphas. Um, and Caiaphas was the acting high priest at that point. Still probably was, uh, would, would have deferred some to his father-in-law. They take him to Caiaphas' home. Now, there's several points to be made about this. 
Um, the accusations that the Jewish authorities made against Jesus, that he wouldn't obey the law, you know, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, everything about this trial before Caiaphas was illegal according to Jewish law. First, it was held at night, and that was illegal. You, you've heard about, you know, things, things brought forward in the light of day. You've heard that kind of expression? Well, that goes back to, to the law that said you, you only can try things in the daytime. You don't try things at night. You don't meet in someone's home. You were supposed to meet in the official courts of the temple for this. And they met in Caiaphas' home. The, it was supposed to start, any trial was supposed to start with a declaration of the charges against them. But they didn't have any charges against Jesus. They, they start by bringing forth, you know, they question Jesus. And then they bring forth witnesses to try to find something to accuse him of, and they are all inconsistent. They're not saying the same things. And finally, Caiaphas resorts to trying to question Jesus directly and get him to say something to, to, uh, to get himself condemned, which he does, because he said, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus says, I am. But um, it, it's also true they were not allowed to have a trial on the eve of the Passover, nor were they allowed to have it on any holy feast day. All of those were, were laws that were broken by this trial that they had before Caiaphas. And as I say, once Caiaphas asked the question, uh, and the high priest would not have gotten involved usually in questioning someone. The high priest in, the, in that day amongst the Jews was seen as the chief mediator, the representative of God on earth. The high priest was the man when it came to the Jewish faith. Of all the people alive, he was the one that was closest to God and the one that, and so he would not have gotten involved in questioning any ordinary criminal, and certainly would not have been participating in something that was so blatantly illegal. But after nothing else worked, Caiaphas himself ends up questioning Jesus and trying to find out what we can hold against this guy. And the minute Jesus says, when asked if you are the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One, when he says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting in the clouds in glory and coming, you know, in judgment, then Caiaphas jumps right on that, tears his robes, and says, that's it. You've heard it with your own ears. It's blasphemy. We don't have to have any other witnesses or do anything else. It's done. Um, so that was uh, Caiaphas, the trial before Caiaphas. Now, the idea was, since that wasn't a legal trial, later on, after daybreak, they would actually have to get the Sanhedrin again to, uh, together again to officially vote in condemnation of Jesus. Um, one of the other rules that they broke was once the judgment was declared that somebody's found guilty, they were supposed to wait 24 hours before they announced penalty. Uh, and it's also true, I keep thinking these things are a violation, that they were supposed to call forth witnesses in defense of the person accused. None of that happened. So there's all kinds of ways where this trial before the Sanhedrin was, was completely outside <coughs> the veil of legality. So the next morning, they have the morning trial by the Sanhedrin on Friday morning, which is when they just simply vote technically in daylight, legally, to, to do what they agreed to do the night before. They then take Jesus before Pilate. Now, the reason they have to do that is because, as we've said, the Jews did not have the authority to execute anyone. Uh, they couldn't, and typically, they wouldn't crucify anybody anyway. Crucifixion was not a punishment the Jews used. They stoned people. In fact, there were, um, there were several ways in which the Jews historically would, would execute a criminal. Um, the beheading was considered the, the nicest one. That's for the least of the crimes, because that was nice and quick and clean. Crucifixion was for only the very worst situations when they took them to the Romans. The Romans had very specific laws. No Roman citizen could be crucified. Um, Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome, not too far apart one another. Um, Peter was crucified, and traditionally he was crucified upside down, which the, which the Romans sometimes did. They would find creative ways to, to change it up. Um, and, but Peter was a Jew, and so he was crucified. Paul, who was a Roman citizen, was beheaded, which we consider much cleaner, much faster. The, the Jewish, uh, the, the cruelest of the Jewish executions was stoning, because that's also slow. It's faster than crucifixion, but it's still slow. It's, it's the literally, you're bruised to death, is what it amounts to. Um, so they take Jesus before Pilate, and they try to, they accuse him and say, you need to have this guy um, crucified, and Pilate said, what has he done? And their answer, according to John 18, is, well, if you weren't a bad guy, we wouldn't have brought him here. That's their answer, the first time. Mm -hmm. And Pilate's not going to take that, so he presses them and says, no, what did he do? And they said, well, he was perverting the nation. Um, he is preaching against the law. 
He's threatened to destroy the temple. And Pilate says, I don't care about any of that. Why are you bringing that to me? That's your stuff, as I said earlier. <laughs> then they start making up other stuff. They say, well, he's fomenting revolution. He tells people not to pay taxes to Caesar. He claims to be a king over against Caesar. And so Pilate says, I need to talk to you. Pilate takes him in private. Pilate considers, comes back out, says, no, he's not guilty. And then we talked about the rest. He tries to send him to Herod. That doesn't work. He tries to have him beaten. That's not sufficient. He tries to trade Barabbas for him, and that doesn't work. And finally, he orders him to be executed. Okay? Um, on Friday night, they immediately go to the crucifixion and to uh, burial of Jesus. Saturday, he is dead in the tomb, and on Sunday is the resurrection and ascension. We talked about that for a few minutes. Um, people, I've known people that get hung up on this idea, bless you. Uh, oh, well, Jesus was in the tomb three days. You know, well, the Jews were notorious for rounding things off. You know, for instance, they said, if you read in Acts, it says that Paul was in Ephesus for three years teaching. Well, Paul was in Ephesus for two years and two months, as best we can tell from the specific uh, details. But they round everything up. There are certain places in the Gospels where it says, or in the New Testament, where it says Jesus arose on the third day. And there are other places where, like Jesus himself said, like Jonah, three days in the belly of the whale, after three days I will rise. But again, that's because they rounded things off. Jesus is using that symbolism of Jonah in the belly of the whale. Jesus was crucified and died on Friday. Um, he, was, he was hung on the cross about nine in the morning. He died by three in the afternoon. Um, they wrapped him in, to prepare him for burial, but they were not allowed, you're not allowed to touch a dead body or have anything to do with that on the Sabbath, and the Sabbath started at 6 o'clock on Friday. And all day Saturday was Sabbath. So first thing on Sunday morning, which was the first day of the week to them, the women go back to finish preparing the body with spices and things of that sort, and they discover that the tomb is open, the stone has been rolled away, and that Jesus is, in fact, not there. Now, um, this gives you an outline of the trial, of the, the, basically the two trials, three trials almost, Annas, Caiaphas, and then the final approval, and then the Roman trials. Pilate, Pilate first, then Herod Antipas, then back to Pilate. This material is all available online for you. Um, I want to <coughs> skip ahead, actually, to something here. This is what it would have looked like when Jesus was buried, so that you get some idea what we're talking about. Uh, we talk about being in the grave. We have a very different idea about what that meant according to the first century. What they would do for a wealthy man's tomb, and Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man who offered his tomb for Jesus to be buried in. This all had to be done pretty quick because they had from 3 o'clock in the afternoon when Jesus died to 6 o'clock when the Sabbath started, because the day starts at sunset, or at 6 o'clock basically, uh, is the start of the new day for the uh, Jewish people. That's why the, the, when Genesis talks about the days of creation, it says, and there was evening and there was morning the second day, because the day starts in the evening to the Jews, not, not at midnight or in the morning. So Joseph of Arimathea, they had to do something quick. He apparently was a follower of Jesus, and he said, you can lay him in my tomb, and he was a wealthy man. So a tomb in that day would have been a large enclosure uh, that was cut out of, of solid rock. They would chisel it out of solid rock. Typically what they would have is uh, steps that lead down through an opening, through a door, into a pit, it was called. And it was basically a recessed area. And around the three sides was what was called the bench, which was an elevated area. That would have been here, around all three sides. Then, off of that, there would be various chambers that were large enough to place a body in, like six feet long. Um, and so this would be a family tomb. And for generations of people, until it was full, and later on, they would actually remove the bones of people who had been buried a long time ago and put them in, in ossuaries, bone boxes, so that they could continue to use it. But this was a new tomb. There was nobody else in there yet. So Jesus' body would have been wrapped, brought in here, and laid on the bench. The bench is where they would lay the body to prepare it for burial. And that's what the women did not have time to do, but they laid the body in the tomb, and they were going to come back after the Sabbath. That is, they laid it in the tomb before 6 o'clock on Friday. They were going to come back on Sunday morning, which they did. The idea of the stone being rolled away, they literally would have an angled slot 
and they would put a large round stone. And we have, there are still examples of that existent in and around <coughs> Jerusalem and in other places as well. And they would remove this, um, this stone, which was the, like the chalk, and the stone would literally, the big stone would literally roll over the entrance and seal it. So that it took a lot of effort to open one of those up again. Because you're looking at a stone that weighs sometimes several tons, that has to be rolled up this little ramp of a hill, and then jam something under it to keep it from rolling back down again. All right? That's not something you do lightly once the tomb is sealed up. Because the expectation was you weren't going to open that very often, only the next time a family member died. So Jesus was in here. He was lying on the bench. He had not been finished in preparation. He was wrapped in the burial cloth that was traditional. Uh, this burial cloth, of course, you know the, the, the idea of the Shroud of Turin. Tradition has it that the Shroud of Turin, which contains a negative image of a, a man who appears to have been crucified because there are blood stains at his wrists and at, on his legs. Um, he, there's a, it's a very, in fact, the interesting thing was for years and years and years, they couldn't really figure out what the image was until finally some, one time they had somebody take a photograph of it after photography developed because this is centuries and centuries old. Um, and while they were processing the photograph, they looked at the negative image. And the negative image gives you a very clear picture of what the person supposedly looked like. The tradition is that this is, this is the burial cloth of Jesus, and the reason that it has that negative image is that when Jesus was resurrected, when he came back to life, he literally you know, went through this cloth. And in the process, whatever mystical energy there was involved in the resurrection left the imprint of his image on that cloth. I don't know if the Shroud of Jordan is real or not. You know, go back and forth on that. At various times, they did, they did carbon testing and said, oh, no, it's only like a 1,000 years old. Then later on, they carbon tested another piece and said it's much older than that. So it's gone back and forth. But you get the idea. This is what it would have looked like. Now, what is the significance, going back a step, to Jesus' death? I think first, we need to recognize that the death of Jesus was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. That is, all people who would accept that sacrifice, who would accept Jesus through that, and so it was the perfect sacrifice. It fulfilled once and for all, all of the requirements that blood must be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Those of you who are in the Pentateuch class, we've just gone through Leviticus, where the, the whole sacrificial system was put in place in order for people to be made right, to, for their sins to be atoned, the remission of sins, that they could be made righteous. Blood had to be shed in order to create that uh, that state of holiness to be in, to be able to be back in relationship with God and then Leviticus goes on with very specific instructions on how once you have through sacrifice been made holy how do you live so that you can stay holy you know that's part of the law of Exodus and it's more specific in, in Leviticus but secondly Jesus's death both echoed the sacrifice of the Passover lamb of Exodus that provided salvation for all people you remember the story when the last of the plagues was getting ready to come upon the Egyptians to prove to Pharaoh he should release the Jewish people from, from slavery, the last plague was that death itself would come through Egypt and that in order for um, the, and the firstborn of all beings, animals and people, would be taken in death. So that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, were not um, subject to this plague. They told them to sacrifice, God gave instruction to Moses to have them sacrifice a lamb, a, a spotless lamb, to take the blood and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and lintel. And when death came through, they sometimes say angel of death. It doesn't actually say that in scripture. That's an old translation, but it just says death. When death came through, any of the Hebrew houses that had blood on the lintel and doorposts the Spirit passed by. That's where you get the Passover, that the spirit, of death, the spirit of death passed over the houses of the Israelites and did not take their firstborn, but did take the firstborn of every other household and every other animal, including the firstborn of the Pharaoh. So the death of Jesus, the blood that he shed, echoed the Passover lamb. And you remember that this happened at the Passover season in Jerusalem. This was a clear echo of that, a reference to that, and it met the obligation for sacrifice for the remission of sin that's set forth in the Mosaic Law in Leviticus. So Jesus' death 
clearly is a fulfillment of the expectation. Now, one of the reasons why animals had to continue to be sacrificed in the Old Testament is because God said the animal has to be as perfect as possible for a sin, uh, sin offering, for a sin sacrifice. No spots, no you know, broken limbs. It has to be as perfect an animal as possible. Well, even as perfect as they could make it, those animals still weren't perfect. And so because the sacrifice was not perfect, it had to be repeated. And repeated and repeated as often as the people would sin. And so there was a regular cycle of shedding of blood, of animal sacrifices, because of the failings of the people. The only way that you can keep from having to redo that sacrifice is if you really did find a lamb, a sacrificial um, a sacrifice, that was perfect. And therefore, it would be a perfect offering for the remission of sin once for all. And that perfect offering is Jesus. Because he was without sin. He was without spot or blemish. Okay? Questions about that? All right? So... Let's talk about the next phase, which is the resurrection. Um, on Sunday morning, when the women of the group went to the tomb to finish the preparation of the body, they found the, the stone rolled back, which took quite a bit of effort, and the tomb was empty. Mary Magdalene, who is there, um, comes out and, and asks, at first she thought this was the gardener, the person responsible for the, for the, the garden that the tomb was in. You know. What has happened to my Lord? What's happened to his body? And she then realizes she's talking to Jesus, that it is Jesus who is there. Uh, Jesus then um, appears on the Emmaus Road to two followers who are walking to the town of Emmaus, talking about what has just happened in Jerusalem. Jesus appears to them. They don't recognize who he is, and yet uh, he talks with them about it and explains things to them. Finally, they get to where they're going, and he's ready to go on. They go, no, come in and you know, have dinner with us. And he comes in, and before dinner, he, bless, he offers the blessing, and when he offers the blessing, their eyes are open, and they recognize this is Jesus resurrected. So that's the first, other than the women in the garden, that was the first clear indication, the first appearance that Jesus made to uh, any of his followers. Then, um, again, Sunday in Jerusalem, Jesus appears to ten of his disciples. Later on, a week later, he appears to eleven of, of his disciples. You remember that um, it was Thomas who was not there. And the others tell Thomas afterwards, Jesus has come back from the dead. He's resurrected. And Thomas goes, uh, you know what? You guys say you saw that, but I'll believe it when I can put my fingers in the, in the marks, in, his, in the wounds in his hand, and my hand in, the, in his side. Well, Jesus appears later to Thomas and says, Thomas, put your finger here. And Thomas falls on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. Um, Thomas has always gotten a bad rap. They always talk about doubting Thomas. In fact, all Thomas was asking was the same evidence everybody else already got. Right? He was asking for the same experience of seeing the risen Lord. Uh, fortunately, Thomas gets credit because after that, he apparently, tradition has, and there's some, some history to support it, that he traveled east all the way to India and was responsible for the planting of churches all the way across parts of Asia. So he became a very important follower of Jesus. Um, so. Uh, later, Jesus talks with the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. He eats fish with them. He, um, you know, calls that he tells them, you know, uh, "Put your put your nets on the other side, and you'll catch more fish." He has the event of reconciliation with Simon Peter, where he asks Peter. They're eating together, and I'm sure Peter's very nervous because Peter had betrayed Jesus three times. And Jesus says to Peter, "Peter, do you love me?" And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Now, this is where the Greek helps. Because Jesus says, uh, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with a pure love, with a, with a divine love? And Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you, which means phileo is Philadelphia. It's brotherly love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Phileo is Greek for to have a brotherly affection for each other. Jesus said, oh, well, feed my sheep. And then he asks him again, do you agape me? Do you love me? And he goes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I love you like a brother. And Jesus says, well, feed my lambs. And then Jesus says again, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter, at the point of almost weeping, you get the sense, says, Lord, 
you know all things. You know that I am God. And Jesus welcomes him back into not only the fellowship of his followers, but also in the leadership of the church. And he will be the most significant leader uh, at the start of the founding of the church. It is Peter's profession of faith through his first great sermon after the, after the Holy Spirit comes on them at the day of Pentecost. This is 10 days after Jesus is resurrected or has ascended. Um, 3,000 people become believers in Jesus Christ from one sermon from Peter. And so, you know, he, he truly did become the rock on which the church was built. And then Jesus ascends into heaven uh, from the Mount of Olives 40 days later. So between the, the uh, resurrection and the ascension is 40 days. Ten more days between the ascension and the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was not, people think of that as a Christian holiday. The day of Pentecost was actually the day, the traditional celebration of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. The reason was, there were 50 days between when the Israelites left Egypt and when they were given the law at Mount Sinai, 50 days. So Pentecost, the Jewish celebration of Pentecost, was 50 days after the Passover, which was the celebration of the Exodus from Egypt, to the giving of the law. Pentecost was a 50-day celebration. That's what Pentecost means, 50 days, Penta. Um, and so they were, all these Jews were in, in Jerusalem from all over the ancient Near East to celebrate the festival of Pentecost, the giving of the law to the Jews. And that was when the Holy Spirit came upon the followers of Jesus. And they spoke in tongues and they professed the good news that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ. Okay? Now... Um, got another uh, chart for you here in terms of the empty tomb and re the different resurrection appearances. But I want to talk for the last few minutes here about evidence for the, G the resurrection of Jesus. There is no one thing that has been challenged probably more than challenged by uh, liberal scholars and skeptics than the resurrection of Jesus because, after all, it is the big miracle. Um, it's, it's the one that makes all the difference in the world. We... The resurrection is the thing on which our hope is based. If Jesus, and Paul says this, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we, our faith is false and we are to be pitied above all people. The resurrection is the thing that proves that Jesus was who he said he was. So let's, uh, there are several theories that people have put forth as to why they think or how they think this worked in order to try to say Jesus was not miraculously raised from the dead. One of them is the swoon theory, the idea that Jesus just passed out. And they carried him and they put him in the tomb and then in the coolness of the tomb he woke up and came back out again and uh, there's several problems with that. One, the Romans were very good at crucifying people. Right? They did this for a living. They did not, people did not just swoon when you nailed them to a cross. And they, the Romans made a habit uh, of making sure the people were dead. That's why Jesus was stabbed in the side with a spear to make sure that you know, he wasn't actively bleeding, his heart had stopped, he was dead. So there's, there's a difficulty with that. There's also the difficulty is that if Jesus was that bad off and they laid him in the tomb and he just sort of was revived by the cool rock he was laying on, then he comes out of the tomb and all of a sudden he, he everyone is just blown away by the fact that he is resurrected in power. He did not look like somebody who was just barely alive. You know, Mary Magdalene did not recognize him as, as Jesus at first because she, you know, there was, he didn't have any appearance of having been wounded or beaten. Remember, Jesus had been beaten so badly before the crucifixion, he couldn't carry the cross piece of his cross. They had to get Simon of Cyrene to do that. There was no evidence. If Jesus had come out and he looked like somebody had been crucified and barely made it through that, he, it's unlikely he would have had the kind of impact on people he did. So Jesus did not swoon. There aren't any scholars who seriously believe that anymore. Uh, there are some scholars who maintain that Jesus um, was, uh, did die and was put in the tomb, but that they forgot which tomb he was in. And they went back to the wrong tomb. Really? <laughs> I mean, this was the man they thought was the Son of God, you know, the one that they believed was the Messiah. They had just been there, and it was a private tomb. It's not like he was buried in, in the middle of Arlington Cemetery where all the crosses looked exactly alike. There was a specific garden that belonged to a specific person. They had just been there 26 hours before. 
They're not going to miss it when they get back. And if they had missed it, then it would have been very easy for somebody else, the, the, the authorities, the Roman authorities, who go to great lengths to try to cover this up later, you know, they pay the guards to lie about it. Uh, it would have been very easy for somebody else who didn't believe in Jesus to come and go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Guys, come over here. You're in the wrong place. That did not happen. A third theory that they put forward is the theft theory, that the, the apostles stole the body of Jesus and then just claimed he had been resurrected. What possible upside was there for that? Again, we think about Christianity as being the dominant religion in the world, and it, it has a lot of influence and a lot of power. These guys were literally scared for their life at this point. You know, their leader had just been killed by the authorities. They could be next. They're not in a position to steal the body and then make a big scene and lie about it. There's no, there's no reason behind that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, particularly, I'm going to talk about what we think is evidence in a minute, particularly by how they acted later. Um, the, probably the most common theory today that is put forward in terms of how it is that Jesus didn't actually be resurrected, wasn't actually resurrected, but the story came out that he did, is what they call the legendary development theory, which means that Jesus really died, but Peter and the other apostles kept dreaming about him and kept thinking about him, and over a period of time, psychologically, they convinced themselves he was still really around. I'm just going to leave that one laying. <laughs> um, and, and particularly, that makes no sense to me, uh, or to most, uh, I think, um, theologically, anyway, conservative scholars, again, because of how the disciples acted after that. It was, it was not a matter of mass hysteria taking them over, you know, this mass illusion, delusion that they had. So let's talk about some of the evidence, some of why we believe that Jesus really was resurrected. First, there is no credible scholar, and I say that absolutely, no credible scholar today who denies first that Jesus was historically real, he was a historical man, nor do they deny that he was crucified by Pontius Pilate around AD 30. There are external evidences for that. Josephus the historian and others, Tacitus, they talk about this man, Jesus, and they talk about the fact that he was executed by, under Pontius Pilate. Okay, so that's the first point, is nobody questions the historicity of this. Secondly, there is no explanation, there's no reason to, uh, or reasonable way to explain the many details that we have surrounding Jesus' death, his burial and his resurrection, such as the fact Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea is a mysterious character. Arimathea is not, does not have any theological significance. I mean, it was not a shrine site or something. There's no reason to say that, to add that to the story, unless it was a historical fact. There's all these little details that get stuck in there that have no benefit to anybody unless they're reporting what was really happening. In addition to that, one of the things in historical um, accounts, or any kind of account, one of the criteria for reliability is multiple attestation, meaning more than one source attests to the same thing. Well, we not only have all four gospel writers saying this, we have other historians talking about these events in more general terms than the other historians, but there is multiple attestation. Um, the next one, which don't be offended by this, is just a historical fact. The fact that women discovered the empty tomb is unlikely to have been made up. Women were considered not reliable as witnesses. They could not give testimony in court. If somebody was making this up, you would not have had women be the first one to discover the empty tomb. You just wouldn't. Um, that's not how it worked back then. It's also true that the witness of the disciples following the resurrection is inexplicable unless they had witnessed the risen Jesus. This, to me, is the most important thing. These guys, guys, men and women, we hear about the men, but there were women there too, they went from being a bunch of frightened people who thought, I could be next, I gotta make sure they don't know I was associated with Jesus. The same sort of thing that Peter reflected when, in his denial of Jesus, they were hiding out, literally. Um, I mean, they were, they were uh, trying to keep the authorities from being aware that they were there, they're keeping their heads down. They went from that to being absolutely 
committed to testifying to the reality of Jesus Christ as being not only the Messiah and Son of God, but the resurrected and living Son of God. To the point that Peter would stand up in the temple courts and the day of Pentecost and preach and 3,000 people come. Peter and John got arrested right after that and got beaten and told, don't do this anymore. And their response to the authorities, the authorities they had been afraid of a week before that or 10 days before that, their response was, who should we listen to, you or God? That is not something, you don't make the change that much. This small group of people, without airplanes or trains or automobiles or, or internet or telex or fax or telephones or anything else, within 40 years of Jesus' death, there were Christian communities in every part of the Eastern Mediterranean. By the year A.D. 100, and we looked at, I should have brought some, some of those maps because we had those in our church history class. By A.D. 100, Christianity existed, even though it was a persecuted religion, still existed throughout the entire Roman Empire, which was almost the whole known world at that point. How could that have happened unless these people were willing to risk everything because they knew that what they saw was real and that Jesus was still alive? There is no other reasonable explanation for how they could have done what they did unless they believed absolutely that it was true and that it was supernaturally true because they had seen Jesus. Okay. No, no other answer makes any sense because there was no upside to being a Christian in those days unless it was because you believed absolutely that it was true. And the risen Jesus was seen by many witnesses. Again, that, that multiple attestation idea there were several thousand that witnessed the resurrected Jesus and were there when he was ascended into heaven. And that was testified to when people were telling this story and preaching about it, when they started writing the accounts later on, there were a lot of people still alive who had been there. And we don't have any record anywhere of anybody coming up and going, no way, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, I was there and that's not the way it happened. They had the opportunity to do that. And they didn't because there were many, many witnesses who were still alive who would, who would come forth and say, whoa, you can say whatever you want, but there were 5,000 of us there and we all saw the same thing. So maybe you should be quiet because you're not telling the truth. So that multiple attestation by many, many witnesses of the resurrected Jesus is why we believe. And the fact that historically it, it sustained itself. Um, in the future, after that. And finally, what is the significance of Jesus' resurrection? I'll finish with this very quickly. The resurrection of Jesus established his authority as the Son of God above anything else. You come back from the dead, and you pretty much have declared that everything else you said and did has more credibility. All right? It's kind of hard to argue with that one. He established his authority by marking the defeat of Satan, of sin, and of death, the great enemies. All of the great enemies. Death, the thing that everyone fears. Satan, the great opponent, the adversary. Jesus defeated him in the resurrection. He announced by his resurrection the beginning of the last days, the affirmation of the establishment of the kingdom of God. Because king, the kingdom of God, the reign and rule of God and his authority throughout all creation, that was Jesus' theme. That was the thing he preached more than anything else. By far more than anything else. That was the core of everything he was about. Coming back from the dead declared and affirmed that the kingdom of God was real and it had started and eventually it would be fulfilled when Jesus comes again. And then finally, the resurrection of Jesus was a precursor, a sort of first act to the final resurrection of all people at the end of the world. That's why Jesus is called the first fruits, meaning he's the first one to come back and be resurrected permanently. Unlike Lazarus and others who were resuscitated or revived, they were really dead and they came back to life, but only for a matter of a few more years. Jesus was resurrected, came back to life forever, and he was the first that will experience that. Okay? Questions or comments about any of that? I know that's kind of a dance. Marvin? Just don't forget the Holy Spirit. Right. The power that uh, assisted them many, many times in many, many ways, so their faith was still renewed but as Paul was on his travels, as Peter was Absolutely. against his house and things like that. Still there. It wasn't like now Jesus is gone. And, yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, the power at Pentecost, I mean, the power that enabled Peter to preach and for the others to support that. Um, 
was because the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost. That was the great miraculous event. But the Holy Spirit came upon them because of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus said, when I depart from you, then the Comforter will come. You know, the Father will send the Comforter. And so it was an absolute belief in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit um, encouraged them. That's one of the other tasks of the Holy Spirit, to encourage. It's the thing that gave them strength based upon what they knew. I mean, it's not like they said, well, we don't know if Jesus... We didn't see Jesus resurrect. We don't know if he really was. And so we got a conflict between what the Spirit's telling us. It was all one consistent thing. But you're right. The Holy Spirit is what empowered them as well. Yes, you're right. Um, I just had a question about the Jewish days, um, whether the modern Jews go by the same days as the ancient Jews. Yes, they use the, they use the, the same calendar. I mean, so there is still at 6 o'clock. It's the next day. Right. right. Sabbath starts at 6 p.m. And it's true that the Jews today, the observant Jews, I mean, most Jews use our calendars, but with regard to the holidays, and the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. You know, it's based upon the lunar cycles, which means that every once in a while they have to adjust it because the, you know, the, 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 sun, the moon's not as consistent as the sun is. Um, and so, whereas we use the solar calendar, and that's more common, there's still some ancient calendars that were based on lunar cycles. And the Jewish calendar, the, the Jewish religious, traditional calendar is still based on the lunar cycle. And that's why Passover doesn't come the same, you know, why Easter comes at a different time every year. Because Easter is linked to Passover, and Passover is based upon a lunar calendar, and that changes throughout the year. That's why it's not, you know, the third Sunday in, in April every year. It can swing as much as like five weeks. Um, so, other questions or comments? Okay.